Why do you think it's important to really think about uh, political theory today in, in a global context? And, and why is it that uh, uh, the national context is not good enough anymore uh, to think about, global theory, about political theory today? Well, for most of the history of modern states, that is, since about the late 16th century, it has been presupposed that kings and queens, or later democratic politicians, when they replaced kings and queens, could more or less set the fate and fortunes of a country. There was an assumption of the national determination of the fate of a nation, whether it was a, a, a fate set by a monarchy or later by a democratic public. Nonetheless, the argument was that rulers, whether democratic or otherwise, more or less could make decisions which were fundamental and had fundamental consequences for their citizens. Today, this idea that states are silos, as it were, relatively self-enclosed silos, is more than ever in question. In my view, we no longer live in a world of national communities of fate, but in a world of what I call overlapping communities of fate, where the fate and fortunes of countries are increasingly intertwined. Whether one thinks of the fallout from the US subprime markets and the eventual development of a global financial crisis, whether one thinks of 9-11 and the decade of, of, of violence uh, that followed the war on terror and so on, whether one thinks about climate change. Whatever area we choose in, human beings and the fate of humankind is increasingly, in, the fate of human beings are increasingly interconnected. Uh, at the level of political theory, what this means is as follows. For most of the history of political thinking, it has been assumed that the political good inheres in the modern state. However we articulate the idea of the political good, whether it's uh, monarchically driven, God-driven, state-driven, popularly mandated, nonetheless the assumption was that the political good could be articulated within the political association delimited by clear borders. Today this is no longer true. In an increasingly interconnected world, in a world of overlapping communities of fate, the fate and fortunes of peoples, as I've said, are increasingly interconnected. So to think politically, we can't just think local, we can't just think national, we can't just think regionally, we must also think globally. And I make one just final point about this. Some of the most pressing challenges that we face now as a generation and our children and children's children will face in the 21st century are all by and large challenges that can't be solved by states acting alone. These are challenges that come from the dealing with collective public bads and trying to produce collective public goods on a global scale. There are a pyramid, or if you want to put it less optimistically, an iceberg of issues approaching us. These are issues to do with our habitat, from climate change to water deserts to desertification and so on. They're issues to do with our life chances, uh, the, the impact of global infectious diseases, poverty, inequality, warfare. And they're issues to do with who makes the rules for global trade, for global finance, for intellectual property rights, nuclear proliferation, and so on and so forth. In each and every one of these areas concerning global habitat, the life chances of human beings, and the rule basis of human interaction. The agenda now is not just national, it's partially global. And mm -hmm. there I'm afraid human beings have yet to show that they're capable of responding to these global collective action problems. But we can come on to that later. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you mentioned the fact that we are now living in a world which is uh, uh, a, a world in which we have overlapping, what you call overlapping communities of faith. So is there a way, to, and, and for you it, it's really introducing a qualitative change, is there a way to, to date when this uh, qualitative change happened and what are the factors which triggered this uh, qualitative change? Well, I think it, uh, the, the, this, this era is often recalled the era of globalization. But the truth is that globalization has existed across humankind, across centuries, really. But its nature and form has changed. And what is distinctive about the current period are a set of new technologies, uh, satellite communications, computerization, digitalization, the internet, and so on, which do not just make global communication possible as never before in real time, but these very technologies reconstitute 
other areas of human activity, such as global financial markets, uh, global production chains, uh, and so on. So these technologies make human communication possible on a global scale, but even more importantly, they reorganize the possibilities of the nature of economic, political, communicative, and legal life. So we can have uh, a global financial market, effectively, that operates on the basis of 24-hour uh, trading. Uh, international, multinational companies can produce products which tie into a global chain of production and supply. When you go into your local supermarket, or I go into my local supermarket, there are goods, there are goods there from all over the world. And when we check out, often in a large supermarket, our order is, is, is uh, uh, sent back to headquarters where computers are processing the orders of each and every person going out through those checkout counters, and new orders for those goods are being sent across the world, whether it's for flowers from West Africa, whether it's for textile products from uh, uh, other parts of the world, whether it's for supply of beef from Argentina. This is a global supply chain now made possible in real time by these changing technologies. So what has happened? Increasingly, throughout the 20th century, and in particularly the last two to three decades, is a growing confluence of change across different areas of human activity, driven by new information uh, technologies, which makes the world more interconnectedness than ever before, ensures that something that happens in one time can easily in place, can ricochet across the world, its instantaneous consequences and so on. This is a new era driven by new technical possibilities. So, so initially this, uh, this qualitative change uh, took place in the areas of, of technology and, and, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the field of economy, and, and then it, it, it had consequences uh, in the political sphere, right? So does it mean that uh, the nation state or the polity as we uh, knew it in classical terms is definitely uh, finished? No. I mean, I, I think if you look at Europe as a, as a paradigm just for a moment, it's not a paradigm for the whole world, but it's a way of answering your question. Mm -hmm. You can be a citizen, you can be a citizen, let's say, of Glasgow, the city of Glasgow, and operate as a citizen in your, in your, in your, in your local city capacity. Mm -hmm. The same person can vote in the Scottish elections. The same person can vote in the UK elections. The same person can vote in the EU elections. So this citizen of Glasgow is, is engaged in four overlapping forms of political membership all of which have relevance at different levels. City politics is preoccupied with distinctive issues of cities. National politics is to do with a whole range of issues that position countries in relationship to each other. But unless there's also another layer of politics, super regional and eventually global, that deals with the bigger questions and problems and challenges that link us all together, climate change being the big paradigmatic one, then these problems will not be solved by deliberation, democracy, accountability, and justice. They'll either be resolved by global markets with all their problems because they produce externalities which run out of control, like the global financial crisis, or the decisions about all these big issues will be taken by small class of states who always take decisions inevitably and not unreasonably in their own interests. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, so you're, you're saying that what is key in all this uh, transformation is the notion of uh, overlapping communities of faith and it makes sense because we started, uh, you started with this notion and that uh, while uh, this notion of overla overlapping communities of faith uh, somehow has found uh, a political and legal framework at the regional level in the European context, at the global level we don't have yet uh, a political and legal framework to really uh, act upon it. But let, let me just take Europe for a minute, and then go to the, the bigger global level. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe mm -hmm. was, uh, Europeans don't like to recognize this, but Europe was the most warmongering region of the world ever. From the late 16th century, Europe explodes out into the world in a process of colonization and empire, which proclaims certain standards for citizens living within European boundaries and negates those standards for people outside those boundaries. And then when empire reaches its absolute zenith in the late 19th and beginning of the 20th century and comes under pressure, European powers turn their force and violence against each other in two calamitous world wars. Who would have thought, and here's the question, that this 
most warmongering region of the world, even the, perhaps despite the Enlightenment, despite the Renaissance, the most violent region of the world, could have transformed itself into a Kantian Pacific Union, which is exactly what has happened. What is now unthinkable in Europe? War among European states. The idea of war among European states has effectively, in the second half of the 20th century, been removed by the establishment of the EU with its sui generis legal structures, legal bodies, a human rights regime, a European court, a European human rights court, and so on. This was unthinkable 70, 80 years ago, and yet it has transpired. Now, at the global level, of course, we don't have such a union. We have, in fact, a world of increasing multipolarity, where the UN system, which was founded in 1945, is increasingly at odds with a world where the balance of power is shifting very quickly, notably uh, to the East. We live in a context of new emerging powers, India, China, Brazil, and others, who want a louder and louder voice, and why not, on the global stage. But on the global stage, our institutions rooted in 1945 are protecting the interests of these old established powers, inevitably those of the West, who were by and large the victorious powers of 1945. Nonetheless, it is the case that the present global order splices together two things, the interests of sovereign states on the one hand, and the universal values of the UN Charter and the human rights regime on the other. And these things push and pull in different ways. Mm -hmm. But the positive thing I want to say is whilst we see signs, as it were, of the development of the universal constitutional order in Europe, we also see some stepping stones at the global level. I think of the law of war and the human rights regime in particular as two sides of the same coin that seek to circumscribe the nature of sovereignty and sovereign power. In the 17th, 18th and 19th century, sovereignty meant effective power, might made right. Today, that is not true in international law anymore. Legitimate authority is circumscribed by claims in international law to maintaining certain democratic standards and human rights values. This is a fundamental shift in human law, so at the international level. So the law of war and human rights regimes together are two sides of a legal coin, which are the beginnings, only the beginnings, of a universal constitutional order. And as we are in the beginning of the 21st century, I think we can see a number of trajectories. We can see the gradual weakening of the UN system in the face of emerging powers which are not adequately representative in the UN system. We can see the fragmentation of the global order to competing rival power blocks, much like the 19th century. Or we can see the beginnings of development of this universal constitution order into a more democratic and just global system. But for that, we would need to meet a number of tests. Can we solve the disputes about trade rules? Can we solve the disputes about financial markets? Can we solve the disputes about nuclear proliferation? Can we solve the disputes about genetic research rules? Can we deal with climate change? And at the moment, this does not look promising. Yeah, David, these three... Uh these three uh, tendencies that you uh, identified, the uh, uh, gradual weakening of the UN system, one, second, fragmentation of world order, and, and third, uh, the beginning of a, of a world constitutional order. So are these, in your view, uh, tendencies which are um, effectively happening, or are these possible scenarios for the future? And uh, so, f first question, is it really happening, and, or are these simply possible scenarios for the future? Well, I think the UN system always spliced together cosmopolitan and universal values on the one hand with sovereign interests on the other, mm -hmm. often producing contradictory effects. Secondly, the UN system embedded above all in the Security Council, but also in the World Bank, the IMF and so on, the dominant interests of the victors of 1945. Not surprisingly, they built the institutions to suit their interests. This is almost not natural. But the world is becoming very rapidly ch transformed from the era of 1945. Economic globalization and multilateralism, one might say, are the victims of their own success. New emerging powers have developed in these contexts, 
with great uh, 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 speed, uh, China and India, for example, have been able to take advantage of selective entry into the global economy to enhance their economic development in a way that was completely unanticipated. The world is, distribution of power in the world is changing faster, I think, than any moment of human history. And if we look at this at the level of a, a multi-dimensional chess game, at the top level, the world is still unipolar or bipolar, let us say. Power is concentrated at the coercive level between the United States and a rising China with Russia. But at the economic level, the world is increasingly multipolar. Uh, uh, the West can no longer write the rules of the global stage as it once could, because the new powerful emerging voices have a capacity to block and veto what it is that is put on the table by Western powers. And at the third level, the third level, let's say, of cultural power, communication, soft power, the internet, we have a babble of voices. Now, in the age of empire, empires cut down from dominant coercive power, economic power, through the culture, in one container. Today, this is no longer true. There is huge complexity between levels. Being the most powerful military country in the world, the United States, doesn't even translate into the capacity of this country to win the peace in Iraq, Afghanistan, and probably now also in Libya as well. Mm -hmm. We live in a much more fragmented, complex global order where there are a babble of emerging voices of different kinds of discourses. And the question is, is there a way of binding these voices together so they all find legitimate expression and yet can compromise with each other sufficiently to mm -hmm. deal with the big issues of our time? You, you, you mentioned so this gradual weakening of the UN system and, and then the beginning of a constitutional world order, but is it possible to, 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 to move forward in terms of a, a constitutional world order with a, a UN system which is weakened, as you said, or, and, and which is running the risk of becoming relevant? And, and what could uh, be, uh, I mean, in other words, can we have a, a constitutional world order without a, a stronger UN? Well, I think that um, there are two points to make here. One could easily be pessimistic about the complexity of global politics today. I think the failure of international negotiations at Doha, financial market reform and climate change, for instance, just for instance, do not point in a very positive direction. Nonetheless, it's a great mistake to read the politics of the present into the past and the future. Circumstances change. As I've said, there are remarkable 20th century developments in Europe, and in international law and politics that can be built on these cosmopolitan stepping stones, as I call them. We're now faced with a number of choices. We know what doesn't work. Market fundamentalist philosophy that stresses that markets are the best way of resolving collective action problems, we know doesn't work. Markets produce massive externalities, they run out of control, they produce energy degradation and environmental degradation, which needs politics. So, number one, market fundamentalism is not the way to go. Two, non-democracy, the politics of small clubs taking decisions in their own interests is also, in my judgment, not the way to go. Because that created the global financial crisis. This has created the energy problems of the current world and climate change. It was the small clubs of industrial nation states protecting their interests that created the financial standards which eventually collapsed into the global financial crisis, which created energy legislation and, uh, 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 and energy patterns which has led to climate change and so on. It's the small clubs regulating, as it were, aspects of human activity in their own interests that have generalized models of risk across the world where the decisions are taken by the few and the risks are borne by the many. Mm -hmm. So can we create a new era that meets just two simple tests. Mm -hmm. And in my view, these are the tests of modern politics. You wouldn't call a modern state a modern state if it didn't have some system of impartial taxation and some system of impartial representation. Mm -hmm. A state that depends for its revenue on the donations of the rich, we wouldn't call a modern state. A state that is represented still to these days by autocrats and monarchs or the rich, we wouldn't call a fair and representative state. 
To be a modern state, you need some system of impartial authority, a scope and sphere of deliberation that isn't intruded upon by particular financial interests on the one hand and unfair representative systems on the other. If at the global level we can meet these tests, then we begin to have ways of understanding how our global order can be more democratic. What does it mean? At the one level, it means reinventing the representative system of states and peoples at the UN level. The Security Council has to be more representative, the World Bank has to be more representative, the IMF has to be more representative, and so on. And the revenues which these bodies utilize in order to pursue global public policy and address global public bans can't just be from the voluntary contributions of the rich because they will always block policy that they don't like. We eventually have to have a system of global taxation, whether it's a global financial tax like a Tobin tax or a global carbon tax. One can imagine any number of possible uh, uh, proposals. But unless we move to a system that is more representative and better financed, we won't have a UN or a global government system robust enough mm -hmm. to meet the challenges ahead. Now, Max Weber wrote that the character of public life is determined by the sources of its revenue. Mm -hmm. This is a very simple but profound statement. In other words, if the sources of revenue are the rich and powerful states, they will always have a stranglehold on what it is that can be done. So global institutions need to be more representative and they need to be funded more impartially to meet the collective action problems that we face. Finally, let me say, and obviously, is this feasible? Well, you and I don't know in the long run whether it's feasible. It was Hegel in the philosophy of Wright who wrote that the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. Wisdom comes when you look back in time, not forward. However, I think there are some optimistic signs. In the last few years, we've seen the collapse of the club model of the G1, as I call it, the United States, the G4, the G5, the G7, into the G20. This recognizes already that the global basis of discussion can no longer just be focused in the rich countries of the world, but must be broadened and widened. Secondly, as a result of the global financial crisis, we've seen an increase in the participation in virtually all the institutions of international financial governance. This wouldn't have been happened. This couldn't have happened before. But thirdly, and something most importantly, we do not see that the emerging voices of the developing world, of the basic countries, the BRIC countries, or whatever we call them, want out. They don't want to undermine the UN system and the system of global governance. They want to be included in it on fair and equal terms. So the challenge is not to include them. The challenge is, can we stop the West from continuing to exclude them on unfair and unreasonable mm -hmm. terms? We'll go back a little bit later to the issue of taxation and representation, but precisely on this very issue of uh, rising powers, China, India, and so on. So you feel that uh, uh, they, they, they are committed to the possibility of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a world order, I mean, of a constitutional world order. And if it is the case, then, so they are committed to uh, a foreign policy which wouldn't be the captive of uh, a, a narrow understanding of the national interest. And, and, and if it is the case, then how, 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 do, how do they uh, fit in the new uh, institutional order at the global level? And how does this uh, institutional order uh, evolve and change? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure I would go along with your first point and say that they necessarily want in to the global constitutional order as, as we know it. Yes. The stepping stones of the law of war and human rights law were ultimately stepping stones created by Western powers above all after they reflected on the catastrophe of the two world wars, of, uh, of the Holocaust and Stalinism and so on. Whether these values can be embraced by all the emerging powers with often their different discourses and different priorities is, I think, a, an open question. But we can come on to this question later. Yeah. What I want to say is something actually a bit more modest and a bit more minimal, which is to say, on the current evidence, these new emerging powers, particularly India and China and others, they want to be represented 
in the global system on more fair and equal terms. They don't want to create alternative institutions. They don't want to run from these institutions. They want their voices to count in the global dialogue that is about the core challenges of our time. Mm -hmm. And that's the point I wanted to say. And the evidence is, for example, the G20. The old narrow clubs of the G1, 4, 5, 6, and 7, everyone now knows, are too small a set of communities based on the old Western interests. The G20 is a stepping stone to a wider discourse among a wider series of, of, of populations and countries. And therefore, I say it's a stepping stone in, in the right direction. So, so this uh, this uh, stepping stone, so we we w would lead, will lead to what kind of uh, values, to what kind of principles, which would give uh, to this uh, new order uh, its normative framework. So, what kind of values, what kind of principles do you envision uh, for this uh, new uh, uh, world order? Well, the principles that preoccupy me in my writings and in my books, especially on cosmopolitanisms, are. are are principles that derive ultimately from an understanding of democracy. The principles that are at the heart of my own normative philosophy, as it were, my own political philosophy, are a cluster of eight or nine principles, but I will reduce this for the purpose of our discussion to a very few. The principles of the equal moral worth of each and every human being, the principles of self-determination, the principles of consent and deliberation, the principles of sustainability to ensure the sustainability of the planet, and the principle of social justice, the avoidance of serious harm to people that damages their capacity to participate in public life and in their own private lives. Now, this cluster of principles were initially articulated, not the principle of sustainability, but the core democratic principles the equal moral worth of each and every human being, the critical importance of self-determination through citizenship, the idea that there should be some social provision so people can meet the minimum standards of living in societies. These principles were set out in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries by social movements struggling to democratize autocratic and absolutist regimes to ensure that rulers were accountable to the ruled, to assure that governors made decisions in the interests of their citizens, in some system of accountability. And the revolution, of course, was the, the transformation of absolutist regimes into democratic, modern, liberal democratic regimes. But there the assumption always was that the equal moral worth of each and every human being, that the pluralism of public life, that self-determination of peoples, could always be entrenched in a border, neat, bordered community. That's the idea of democracy. That is the wonderful notion of modern democracy on the one hand, and its tragic limits on the other. Democracy is for citizens who are included in borders. Decisions are made for them in a system of governance that assumes that once every few years there will be a democratic election and rulers will have a democratic mandate to take whatever decisions they need to be taken on behalf of their citizens. But today, it seems to me, these principles are as important as ever. Let me say, the principles of the equal moral worth of everyone, the principle of self-determination of all human beings, the absolute centrality of minimum concepts of social justice to ensure that people's life expectancy and life chances are protected, and to add to that some notion of sustainability. Now, these principles were once thought that they could be entrenched in silos, as I call them, in the containers of bordered states. Today, if my arguments that I've already made to, uh, uh, are true, this is no longer the case. Democracy is no longer something simply entrenched in silos, because the challenges of our era burst these silos. So what does that mean? It means that we need to think of the future of democratic politics as a politics of cities, Glasgow I mentioned, as a politics of subnational regions, states in the US, regions in China, subnational regions, Catalonia, Scotland, in Europe, but also states that need their vitality to be responsive to their citizens, but also at the super regional level, like the EU, but ultimately also at the global level as well. This is the prospect 
of a multi-layered, multi-level democratic system that builds on the stepping stones of the universal constitutional order that I already talked about, that builds on the conventions of human rights, which are familiar to all of us, that builds on democratic achievements that have, but seeks to systematize these at a much more complex multi-level state so that citizens can enjoy different kinds of citizenship appropriate for the world in which they live. But these principles, I mean, equal moral worth, uh, self-determination, consent and deliberation, uh, social justice and finally sustainability, they are clearly at the core of, uh, of uh, the democratic message, but it has been historically so far uh, a Western message. So how do we use it as a basis to, to build a bridge with the non-West? I mean, you also mentioned uh, cosmopolitanism and, and uh, I mean, democratic culture. Uh, do you feel that the new rising powers, I mean, mainly coming from, the, from Asia, are somehow uh, sympathetic towards this, uh, these principles and, and, and you well, know, how do we go about this? Well, I'd say, I'd say many things about that. First of all, I would say, to paraphrase the American philosopher Bruce Ackerman, there is no country in the world without women who not, do not seek equal standing and equal rights with men. There's no country in the world without men who seek to throw off the yokes and demands of deference. There's no country in the world without people seeking to free themselves from the burden of physical need. The principles of equal moral worth, self-determination, minimum standards of justice and so on, are the conditions of a just life, of a just democratic life, in which pluralism can flourish, but constrained by the recognition that each and every one of us are due our recognition as well. So my first argument would be that these democratic values, or cosmopolitan principles as I call them, are the basis of the yearnings of all human beings, wherever they are, for a life of self, of choice, of self-determination and self-governance. That's the first thing. Second thing, we should not distinguish the origins of principles, say in the West, with their validity. The fact that certain principles have their intellectual origins in the West it says nothing about their intellectual validity in general. And thirdly, we would be right wrong to say, as I know you are the first to recognize, mm. that these democratic ideas belong to the West. Think of Brazil, think of India, the greatest, largest democracy in the world. It would be an extraordinary insult to the Indians to say that democracy was just a Western notion. <laughs> So my view is that these principles are the underlying principles that are embedded in every struggle of every human being everywhere mm -hmm. to bring power to accountability, to create a space for self-determination, and to recognize their ability to make their own choices, but always choices of all of us constrained by the choices of others. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that without violence is through extending this into a dialogue and ultimately a democratic dialogue. And so, on the basis of these principles, uh, uh, which you are telling us have a, a, a universal reach and a universal validity, what kind of institutions do we build? Well, let me build on what I've said for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 a thought experiment which is inspired by John Rawls, but different to John Rawls. Just imagine if we thought of the whole world order as one tower block, mm -hmm. one tower block. So today, at the top level, you would have the United States living in the penthouse and Europe somewhere up below, helipads and water supplies and abundant energy, rapid lift services, and good, reasonable health services and so on. As you go down the tower block, you get actually more and more people packed into more and more into the floors, mm -hmm. living in increasingly compact, compressed lives with less space, mm -hmm. less resource, slower lifts, less access, mm -hmm. and so on. Now, if you ask these people to do a thought experiment and say, how would you design a world order if you didn't know what floor you were going to eventually end up on on this tower block? At the moment, we all know where we end up. Someone's an American citizen, someone's a Chinese citizen, someone's a, we know where we will end up. But if you strip us of the knowledge of where we will ultimately end up, just suspend that one assumption and say to people, design a tower block as a metaphor for the world order, 
if, as if you did not know where you would end up. And what do people design? I do this with students all the time. What do they design? They design a system of fairer distribution of resources, greater equality of opportunity, uh, greater minimum standards guaranteed to each and all, greater concern with global collective action problems and, and externalities, and so on. Just <laughs> the same principles that we spoke about mm -hmm. earlier. <laughs> so, what institutions? There is no simple institutional blueprint to create a more democratic global order. We just need to know what our direction of travel is. Mm -hmm. If you think of the literature, the great literatures of political philosophy and theory in the 16th, 17th century, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau and others, they developed concepts for a new world order, the idea of the modern state, which took some years to crystallize into its contemporary state form. Today, we need to redefine what we mean by the political good in the mm -hmm. ways that I described earlier. And we have to set out the stepping stones to a universal constitutional order marked by greater democracy and justice. Mm -hmm. We can say what that means in the short term. It means a democracy, a democratizing process in the UN. Mm -hmm. It means changing the representative structure of the Bretton Woods institutions of the IMF and the World Bank. It means building institutions to be able to handle issues of environmental injustice and to deal with issues of climate change. But we can start with small steps mm -hmm. and just so long as we are on a road consistent with our principles and consistent with the ultimate goal of giving equal voice and dignity to each and every citizen and at the global level creating forums of debate an assembly which are more representative of the world as it is today, of the new emerging voices, and so on. We cannot any longer run the world on a club model based on the pattern of historical power from the 16th century to the late 20th century. This world order is changing, and if we want collective institutions that are, can govern in the name of the wider interests of humanity, we have to include these diverse voices in a more democratic global, just, equitable, and sustainable world order. Now, this is a very, very ambitious project. I've written about it all my life. There are no guarantees that we will move in this direction. As I've already said, this, where we are today is not where you would ideally start if you wanted to travel in this direction. But knowing the direction of travel is critical to knowing how we can solve policy debates that affect us today. Trade rules, financial market rules, genetic research rules, climate, and so on. Uh, so, so one of the key uh, uh, elements to really move forward uh, step by step is to really widen participation and representation uh, and uh, as a way to go beyond the, 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 the West uh, uh, paradigm as a way, to, uh, as a way to, to go beyond the, the club paradigm and so on. But I mean, this widening of participation and representation, should it, should it go beyond the intergovernmental dimension? What about popular participation and representation at the global level? And if you feel that it is something which is a, a, a workable possibility, how do we go about I mean. First of all, is it something which is desirable? And secondly, you know, if so, how do we go about this? I would say three things about that. First of all, it's important to be clear about the direction of travel. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have to also be clear that whilst it takes time to build institutions, the trouble is that most of the global collective action problems we face need to be solved in this century. Mm -hmm. So we are faced with a paradox, human culture, identity patterns, institutions take a long time to build and change. And yet, we are faced with circumstances of great urgency, mm -hmm. above all those of the irrevocable change to our climate and habitat. How then can we create institutions and travel on the road fast enough to make a difference? Well, we can't be optimistic, but nor should we be pessimistic. Mm -hmm. First of all, we know what doesn't work. Market fundamentalism doesn't work. Narrow club models don't work. 
So we know we have to be more inclusive, more participatory. We have to change our institutions at the formal level, but we also have to change them at the level of civil society, because it's there where people participate in social movements and social challenges and social networks and public-private networks that innovation and governance into innovations happen. So this transformative process has to be, as I've written about in some of my books over the years, a double-sided process. We need to both democratize our governance institutions at the local, national, and global levels, but we also have to ensure that civil society is vibrant, dynamic, and full of mischievous protesters who demand of those who have power and make policies that they take account of the pressing global challenges of our time. What does this translate as an institutional pattern? Well, I think it translates into a world that I've already hinted at, in which Europe is something of a paradigm of multi-level, multi-layered authority from the local city to through the region to the global level. It must mean the democratization of our global governance institutions. We can still have a Security Council based on the fair representation of regions of the world, not the old power structures of 1945. After all, if you were redesigning the Security Council today, would you give Britain and France a veto power? Would you put them on the same standing as the United States and China, for example? And the answer is, of course, you wouldn't. You would seek a system of representation in the Security Council that embodies the voices of the world's regions on a fair and equal basis. You could still have a chamber of states, as the General Assembly is at this time, but I still think you need a chamber of peoples, a, 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 a chamber of people's voices, so the world's peoples have direct access to a deliberative chamber to raise and debate issues of pressing global concern. Now, what is the actual model of this diverse, representative system at the global level. Well, I think at one level, the European Parliament is one such model. But there are many such models. I do not think it is easy to imagine in the short term the direct election on a global basis, as it were, of a single global parliament. But there are many ways to make something happen like that in the short term. For example, uh, the election of single country parliaments to such a chamber in proportion to the size of their population, let us say. Uh, there are a variety of proposals we could put on the table. The shortage is not of good intellectual ideas or of good policy prescriptions. The real shortage is not there. We can work on these models. We can develop these <laughs> models. The real shortage is the urgency of political will and decision mm -hmm. to step in this direction. And why is that the urgent issue? Because today, Sovereign interests are re-entrenching to protect what it is that they have at just the moment when they need to find a way of dealing with the collective goods and bads we have spoken about. Uh, two questions, uh, David. One on civil society. What, what I mean, what is the the health, if you if, if you will, of, of civil society today? I mean, in the U.S., I mean, what is striking, you know, I, I find it striking is a, a sense of uh, of political apathy in a way. So first question, what is the health of, uh, of civil society around the world, including in the US? And, and, and second, this uh, uh, deliberative chamber that, you, that chamber that you mentioned, would it be based on party politics? Because if it is the case, then it seems to me that maybe you have a problem because, you know, both in developing countries and, and in developed countries, really, we are witnessing today a crisis of political representation. So how do we go about this? So first of all, civil society. Well, civil society was thriving in the world in the 1990s, really. Yes. I suppose that was the apogee of, of the global civil society movements. And why did it come to a halt? It came to a halt, it seems to me, not because civil society ran out of steam, as it were, but because 9-11 occurred and the war of terror followed. This changed the political atmosphere of the first decade of the 21st century quite decisively. I would even go so far as to say that the response to 9-11 was partly designed to depoliticize civil society, was designed to create a state of warfare, a mentality of warfare between us and them, the United States and the threat of Islam and Islamic fundamentalists, 
which would depoliticize American politics in certain respects. Um, but that war, I think, is largely now discredited. The American century proved to be an American decade. The United States has learned that it cannot project its power and will across the world without compromise, without agreement, without negotiation, without consent. It's learned that the model of the narrow coalition of the willing cannot produce consent and win the consent of people or the hearts and minds of people. I think civil society in many parts of the world is still thriving. Wherever you go, there are NGOs and different kinds of participation. But the real problem is this. We can't simply ennoble civil society. Civil society, especially in the age of the internet and global communications, is that space, actual and virtual, of a huge diversity of voices. For example, in the US, some pro-abortion, some anti-abortion. In Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, some pro uh, the liberalization of sexuality, some absolutely against it on the grounds that this is the way of maybe of spreading the risk of uh, AIDS, HIV, and so on and so forth. So we see a babble of voices in civil society. The critical thing is the vitality of it and the pluralism of voices, it seems to me. But the reason why civil society is never enough is because civil society will always articulate a diversity of interests and voices which need to be mediated by a system of representation in order to win democratic consent, the democratic vote. Now, you've asked me how this plays out at different levels, and in particular at the global level. And, and, in, connection today, with, and in connection, David, with party politics. Yes, exactly. I think today that politics is potentially everywhere. To go back to my early example, Glasgow, Scotland, the UK, EU, and beyond to other forms. This is a rich texture of politics which each of us could, in principle, engage with. So it is not for want of opportunity, as it were, in some parts of the world at least. But what is fundamentally in doubt now is that old 19th century form of aggregating votes through party systems. Parties everywhere are in a state of gridlock. The US Congress is gridlocked between uh, competing interests, some in the party system itself, some through lobbying and so on. And European politics as well is often uh, 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 in the mire of coalition building and coalition uh, politics. So can we imagine a party system either at the European level or at the global level? I don't think so. This is beyond, in the short term, even the medium term, our capacity to imagine as effective political organizations. No, I think we need much more direct uh, mechanisms of political representation, much more deliberative mechanisms of political representation in which deliberative chambers at all levels are representative of the diverse voices in societies and regions of the world, and that is magnified up to the global level. You don't need parties to organize these yeah. voices. You need clear, deliberative channels to project the authenticity and authority of these voices into decision-making fora. So I see that a global chamber would ideally be statistically representative of the diverse regions of the world, of the diverse peoples of the world, and would have you know, a powerful, let's say, decision-making influence on policy-making at the global level, a mm -hmm. vital source of the articulation of voice, of diversity of voices, to be taken account of in other chambers where policy is set and made. But historically, I mean, you know, the, the, the way we have been going about uh, participation and uh, representation has been through the, 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 um, a certain level of, of uh, institutionalization, which has also meant a certain level of uh, uh, professionalization of politics. So how do we go about, and, and clearly it has been a source of problem more often than not, so how do we go about this so that we avoid this problem at the global level? Yes. Well, politics at, at, at the local and, and regional and national level have been really built around the 19th century Weberian conception of hierarchical bureaucratic parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was the industrial solution to politics, the industrial counterpart of politics, the notion of the centralized party that alone, it was thought, 
could organize voices and interests in a particular articulation at the national level. But this was before the age of new communications. It was before the age of digital technologies. It was before the age of the mobile phone, of the internet, of direct communications. It was before the age of the possibility of polling people across the world with almost instantly about their views and choices on various sorts of questions. This is not the 19th century world of hierarchical bureaucratic organizations, whether industrial or party-based. It's increasingly a much more decentralized, confusing world of multiple voices in new network communication systems. This, I think, suggests the possibility of changing our political imaginary away from the idea that you represent people's interests just through party mechanisms and so on, and more, that we recognize that we have the capacity to represent people's views and groups' views and the views of others directly through these new mechanisms of network communication, deliberation and so on. It's an entirely different model of politics. But in a way, you see, the, the, so you are saying that the, the, the political culture in, in which we continue to live in uh, hasn't, hasn't um, I mean, is still behind when it comes to uh, the, the, you know, the technology, the, 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 the communication means which we have today. And then second question, what are the trappings of this uh, new uh, communication uh, world in which we are? Well, I think that, as I, as I said earlier, we don't start from nowhere. Okay. We start already in the beginning of the 21st century knowing a number of things. We know that we are capable as human beings of committing the most horrific atrocities in relationship to each other. We have reinvented our institutions to try to mitigate this. We have, in Europe, built the European Union to create a Kantian Pacific Union that abolishes war within Europe. At the global level, we've created constitutional stepping stones to a new universal order that embeds the law of war on one side and human rights law on the other. And for all the limitations of these structures, and they are very, very limited, they are nonetheless achievements. They embody the wisdom of the past that we need to build on in our politics. And what do these structures tell us? They tell us that politics in communities still matters that politics in cities still matters, that politics in states still matters. But we need new structures in the digital network age in which we can aggregate voices in the only way possible to produce non-violent forms of collective action to deal with global collective issues. We know also what doesn't work. Market-first philosophy doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Market fundamentalism doesn't work. The small, narrow clubs of taking decisions in their own interests doesn't work. So what are we left with? We're left with something absolutely fantastic. We're left with something absolutely glorious. The reinvention of the idea of democracy. Mm -hmm. Once the city-state, then the nation-state, now at the global level, a wonderful world of pluralism and diversity and interlocking democratic fora that embed in these interlocking democratic fora legal principles, human rights concerns, principles of justice, and so on. This is the vision embedded in our past that Cosmopolitan seeks to project forward as a choice we can make. And as a choice we must make because we know what does not work. And so what is left is this productive way forward. So I argue It's realism that is dead, it's market-first philosophy that is dead, but it's cosmopolitan justice that is the new realism. And, and so perhaps as a way to, to end our conversation, uh, the notion of global policy. I know that you are very much interested in this notion, and it seems to me that you are seeing it as a way to, to try to make this uh, new vision uh, of democracy a possibility. So tell us a bit about... Uh, Uh, how you, 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 you see this notion of global policy and the need for it? Well, global policy is something that is already done at many levels. I'm just completing a book which is a, a, a reflection on uh, 20 case studies of global policy in finance, trade, security, health, pandemic, security, uh, and other areas. Uh, if we just take health, for instance, 
health policy already has a global dimension. You have the WHO, for example, and its capacity to, to monitor and uh, 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 have surveillance systems on global infectious diseases. You have hybrid organizations like the Global Fund, which seeks to concentrate uh, donor power to produce uh, benefits for the distribution of antiviral drugs to meet the challenge of AIDS, HIV. And you have private companies and private initiatives, for example, the polio vaccination campaign that was partly driven by the American Rotary Club as one of the key catalysts for fundraising. In other words, you have at the, at the global level, whether you're thinking about finance, climate change, uh, or, or health, a diversity of actors already making policy beyond the level of the nation state through intergovernmental fora, through public-private partnerships, through NGOs, through private corporations. And this at the moment is a wonderful pluralistic system of policy making, but like all pluralistic systems, it risks chaos, uh, incompleteness, ineffectiveness, contradictoriness, and so on. So what I'm interested in thinking about is how human endeavor in all these different sectors, from finance to the environment, can begin to think about global policy more systematically in a sector-by-sector -sector way that produces outcomes which are both more effective, no point unless they are, but also more representative of the voices of the stakeholders engaged in these policy processes. And for this, I've created a new vehicle, the journal Global Policy, which is precisely aimed at engaging a new global debate between academics and policymakers on these pressing issues of our time.